Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's do some pod crashing. Episode number 294 is with Payne Lindsay from the podcast Talking to Death. I'm doing great. How you doing? Absolutely fantastic. I'm going to start it off with this question because I got to know, are you still stalking Ewan McGregor? Uh, I think that I've discovered that he's stalking me and right. now I'm, I'm the one who's paranoid. Don't, don't you hate it though? When, when you do that, when you bump into somebody and you keep bumping into him and you're trying to figure out, okay, what life am I living? Is this just another universe like Marvel or what? Yeah. I'm like, is this like some glitch in the matrix situation or is it like some destiny or am I just crazy? Like what is happening? <laughs> I got to ask you, I realize you started your podcast in 2016, but you are way too smooth to be a podcaster. Who's only like seven years old. Where, where did, where did all this, this, this smoothness come from? Uh, well, thank you. I, I didn't know I was that smooth. Um, I, I, I think it honestly just came from, me being uh, a fish out of water and, and doing this in the first place and just putting a lot of time, thought and care into the presentation of this, assuming that someone's going to say, this guy shouldn't be doing this because that's how I felt. <laughs> right? um, I think I just made myself get better at it. Dude, I remember being with iHeart and I was telling them about about this thing called podcasting back in 2012. And they go, I don't know what you're doing. Just just keep doing it. We'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, oh, they should send you a check for that. <laughs> so what was it like to sit down and break it down with Jeff Foxworthy? Because it really seems like he was trying to make a comparison between comedy and what he's he's got a, a final part of his joke, whereas podcasters, we don't. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, he, he has some really good points about that. Um, it's funny because I've always found him, him hilarious. As a kid, I grew up watching this guy. And so to be sitting down across from him talking on my show was surreal and super fun. But yeah, I, I think there is something about comedy and dark humor. I mean, even if I'm you know, deep in some sort of missing persons investigation and I'm doing all this stuff and it's really heavy material, sometimes like, you know, behind the scenes, the only way to kind of really keep your mind clear and keep going and not lose it is a little bit of like gallows humor yeah. where you're kind of, it's just, it's so bad. It's absurd in a way to almost in a way to like digest it. Yeah. And so I think that there is some weird like line sometimes between humor and, you know, the worst things on earth. Yeah. Because I mean, you even stated it. If we can't relate with it, how are we supposed to even laugh about it? I mean, we, we have to have that, yeah. that, that dark side. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that, you know, that if you can do that, I think that you've, taught yourself something in terms of like how to cope with life um for me that's how i like to do it yeah if, if it's so bad it's it's it gets so bad it's funny it's just so bad it's ridiculous I, w I would love to see your personal research on on when you put one of these these crime podcasts together in in the way that it's like okay why are they coming here how long do i have their attention and have i gone too far or have i, have I not gone far enough Mm, you mean like in the storytelling process? Yeah, because because I'll tell you what, one of the reasons why I created the podcast and iHeartRadio called Pod Crashing was because I was really going to go on there and I was going to become a critic. And I and I, I sat down to do the first show because it was against Will Ferrell. And I said, I, I don't have the balls to do this. I, I don't want I don't want to do this. And so I thought, OK, if, if we if I can't critique them, then teach them. And I, I feel that when I listen to to your podcast, because you get on there and you question the monologue. Is this too long? If you're not going to be here, I don't care. Go now. But hopefully you'll find me later. I mean, I love the way that you're so open. Well, thank you. I mean, I honestly make all of my shows how I would want to listen to them. Yeah. As a person who doesn't really, who, whose like attention is hard to get, right? I'm the kind of person who has ADHD brain and I might tune out of your podcast in one minute if I'm not being helped along or intrigued or hooked in in some way. So I'm kind of making it where like, okay, I'm, I'm consciously thinking about those little intricacies as I'm building it so it, so it grabs my own attention, to be honest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, and, and I feel like I'm conceited when I do that because I'll take my podcast out for a walk. I'll sit there and listen to it in the real <laughs> world, in the car, because I'm thinking to myself, this is where the listener is, dude. Figure it out. It's kind of true, though. Yeah, that's what I always do, too. It's like I, I never go back and listen to, to old stuff, but once I post a new episode – the morning that it comes out and it's already live where it's too late to take it down, <laughs> I'll listen to it one time, like on my commute 
and I'll just really kind of give it a, a solid critique of my own, knowing that I go, I can't go change it now. Right. And so if, it, if I really hated it, I'll always remember that, and I won't do that again the next time. Wow. I, I've never met anybody who gave away a podcast studio. Where did that even come from? I was honestly just sitting in, in my studio, and I was like, what can we give away in here? I was, like, <laughs> I was like, actually, you know what? Like, we have a couple extra. I was like, wait a minute. And, like, within five minutes, we walked around, and, you know, we had, like, a entire extra setup that, like, I mean, in 2016, I would have, you know, sold my like my Xbox for, you know? So I I, uh, I was like, okay, this is actually pretty cool. And I'll, also, I, I didn't know how to even assemble something like that back in the day. So, um, yeah, I just thought it would be a, a fun thing to give away. So where did you find it in your heart and your creative path to decide that I'm not going to settle on one? Because, dude, I, I have 14 podcasts. And, and when, so when yeah, I heard about yeah, all impressive. of yours, well, it's because I, I'm a radio guy. I, we're, we're taught one thought per break. Why am I putting rock stars with chefs? You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. I mean, so, so it's mm-hmm. like, okay, so create a podcast then, dude. One thought per break. And, and you're doing the same thing. You've got so many. How are you keeping Keeping your head on straight. I mean, I, I think that it just it, it's how I got here in a way. I mean, I made Up and Vanished in 2016 and it got really popular and I was the Up and Vanished guy. And I wanted to uh, I almost felt limited by that, even though it was, you know, the most accolades I had ever got for anything I'd done. I felt limited by that. And I immediately went and made with iHeart uh, Atlanta Monster, which was a totally different story. Uh, be able to explore as a creator and as long as I can keep getting the opportunity I'm going to keep trying to do that yeah you always say yes I mean I, that's what I, right. I, I can feel that in, in in your presentation well I definitely say no sometimes <laughs> <laughs> I say yes to you though <laughs> <laughs> but but to build it that's one of the things that listeners oh so you do a podcast what is it like 15 20 minutes I wish it was 15 20 uh-huh. minutes I mean the hours okay. that you must put into your presentations yeah, it's like unquantifiable, to be honest. People ask me all the time, like, how long does it take? I'm like, I don't know. It takes forever. Um, you know, like I might work for a half day on one minute, but then uh, at the same time, I might finish 25 minutes in one day, wow. depending on how it's structured and what it is. There's a lot of different layers to it, especially with like a, a true crime story that I'm telling. It's, you know, there's interviews that I've really done and, you know, taking these pieces out and painting a story with them and using music and, what's the, the most clever way to arrange this to get your attention and to have this payoff ending and keep every episode kind of folding on top of itself and snowballing into some sort of conclusion and how do I sound like I'm not being, you know, <laughs> too much of this, but like relatable and like, hey, like we get it, don't be like fake, but also hold my hand a little bit because I need it. <laughs> like what's the balance, right? Wow. Um, and I'm just always trying to think about that. Are you doing your own editing or is it Mike that's helping you out there? I mean, what what's his job? Mike is definitely probably my go-to editor. I, I, I still edit most of my podcasts, um, not entirely, but just a little bit of a hands-on thing um, just to have a, my blueprint, like just my, my touch on it. But um, I kind of like editing though. It's uh, To me, it's kind of how I've been able to get as deep as I've been able to get into the stories is by editing it and listening to this tape over and over again, kind of drilling it into my head where I, I feel like I have this genuine understanding of it that, that I might not get from just listening to it, like the finished product one time. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, do you ferment it? In other words, do you set it aside and come back as the editor? Because I, the, the the performer and the editor are not the same people. And, and it's like, I have to keep them separated. You have to. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have to be able to, say okay that's it come back um you know and then if you're in a groove try to stay in there as long as you can to to get that thought out but eventually you're like okay you're beating a dead horse beating a dead horse it's like you can't you're you're gonna keep fit, like you know touching this thing and you're gonna end up breaking it if you don't just come back to it later and see it from a different perspective do you left hand right hand your tracks because i mean like my questions are in the left uh, track right now yours your answers are in the right track only because when i screw up i i, I have to go back in there and redo my question because i'm gonna screw up oh yeah i mean i i, I if i'm in person it's harder because you might hear me in the background a little right. bit but if i'm doing a, 
a phone call interview, right. I might uh, step over you in our conversation, but not in my edit. I'm not going to, <laughs> right. I'm going to sound real good. Yeah. Let's, let's talk about that title because they always teach us, Oh, you know, when, when we go to our little podcasting schools and seminars that talking to death, what, what made you settle in on that title? I think because it's a, uh, it's a, it's a phrase. It's like an idiom that people are loosely familiar with. People have said that before. Yeah. It has a, a touch of the true crime element that you might know me for. And it can get dark and weird, which is a lot of the stuff I create and do is that. And also it's just quite simply like, I'm going to talk you to death. Yeah. And really that's kind of what it literally means to me. But I also kind of do things that have to do with death, but it's kind of a, it's more of a not serious approach to the stuff that I do, which is sometimes very serious. Yeah. One of the things that I noticed on my iHeart app, and it just might be the app, I don't have a picture of you up there. There's, there's nothing that's promoting the show. It's just a blank box. Are you doing that on purpose? No, it sounds like an error. Yeah, yeah, there's something wrong because, I mean, that to me, that's, you know, judging a book by its cover, I'm going, well, damn him. What, he, he won up yeah, to me, no man. Yeah, there's no cover. Yeah. There's no face. <laughs> so were, were you shocked about Steve-O when he started talking about the crime crime stories and stuff? Because, I mean, I was. I had no freaking clue that he was so <laughs> into it like he is. I really didn't. And, you know, that, that was, uh, I was pretty nervous for that one because, I mean, I grew up watching this guy. And I just know him as the guy from Jackass, yeah. right? I mean, he's Steve-O. I mean, I grew up watching, like, the, the MTV show and then the movies. And all. I'm like, okay, I'm talking to this guy, and he wants to talk to me about something serious? I'm like, can I even do this? <laughs> and, you know, I was like, maybe he'll just be cool. And, like, we sat down, and he was super cool. And he goes, okay, so I want to talk about the death penalty. He just went straight into it. And I'm like, in the edit, we, we moved it around because it got so serious so fast. I was, like, thinking in my head, I was like, man, I had this whole idea of, wanting steve to give me a tattoo at the end of this and i don't know how i'm going to get there um because we're talking about something really serious right now but we ended up having this really amazing conversation that went went all over the place and i was just like uh, blown away by just how candid he was and the depth he had about serious subjects and how it was a kind of a surreal experience talking to steve from jackass about you know the death penalty yeah yeah. I mean, in reality, that that dude should have the perfect life. I mean, I mean, he, he came from a very, very big family. He traveled the world. I mean, many of us are out here going, God, I want to do something like that. But he, he <laughs> right. but he wants all the attention. Yeah. I mean, he's always he's like the class clown of America almost. Right. It's like he he really, truly is that guy who thrives off of that. And he'll tell you that. And once you kind of understand that and you realize he's being serious about how he feels about seeking attention and uh, like the the work and time and, you know, respect he puts into his stunts, you get that. Oh, wow. This is he's not just like lazily doing this. He's not just sloppily putting this together. This is like a performance. It's like a lifetime performance yeah. in a way. Oh, yeah, because, I mean, I really was drawn into the story when he goes, he says, okay, well, I'm only as good as my last stunt. What am I going to do next? And yeah. I, I feel like as a podcaster, we have to do the same thing. What's next? Yeah. Yep, yep. And then I was like, that one hit home. I was like, well, I know that feeling. And it's like, wow, it just turns out you're. this is your craft, right? And like, I was seemed like it was like well duh yeah like this is what he does but you just don't look at steve-o like that right. right you don't you you kind of throw out that this is some sort of craft of his but really it is i i can't do that stuff <laughs> um and he's got and also he's done a really good job of not really hurting himself I, I, I he's kind of like a nimble gymnast in a way i mean i would have already broken my neck Oh my God! And and you invite people to watch the video, which I think is fascinating that you've jumped on that. I'm I'm a radio guy. I when I saw Casey Kasem on on the Hardy Boys back in the '70s, I thought I don't like him anymore. I don't like the way he looks. That's not the way I envisioned it. Right. But but you, uh, you you're doing the video thing. I mean, ah, where's the mystique in this, man? Man, I, I just uh, I to me I, I I came from the filmmaker brain. Yeah, right. I didn't like to me. I, I looked at like, someone like you as the radio person that does what I can't do. Right. Then I ended up making podcasts in my career, but because I'm capable of filming this, I also wanted to, because I've done so many deep dive investigations and talk to people in person. I wanted to get that in person vibe if I could create it. So I've really gone out of my way to do all these interviews in person, which has been difficult 
And like, like if, I'm, if we're here, let's just film it. Cause I think that, you know, at the very least, I want to show you a moment from this because mm-hmm. I think it might it, it mean more if we do it right. Mm-hmm. And so we're kind of trying to, we're not trying to do it just for fun. We want it to be kind of a, to live a little bit longer or, or be an extra layer of the experience if you want there to be. Speaking of that living longer, boy, my eyes were opened up when he said that when he goes, he says, when, when, when Steve was talking about, you know, oh, I'm going to do video and it's going to last long. And, and, and then when he realized it does not last that long. Yeah. I mean, he seems like he, uh, like mortality kind of, or the idea of mortality really kind of kicked in. And yeah. I mean, that kind of spooked me. I was like, wow, <laughs> like steve saying this, <laughs> when is that going to hit me? Or, or has it already? Is it hitting me now? Like, <laughs> I don't know. I got to <laughs> ask you the same question that I do on my murder mystery authors that I talk with. And that is, uh-huh. is that why aren't you putting yourself on the stand when you've got all that information in your hand about these people that should be in prison? Be, I mean, or are you being, are you, are you being called to sit on that stand? You've got the information. They don't want me to. Why? They, they don't want to incentivize a podcaster to solve their murder. <laughs> they don't want to do that. And like, they just don't. Um, and I, I've had some, you know, some really bad experiences. I've, I've had some outlier good experiences. Uh, like I'll say like the Colorado Bureau of Investigation did reach out to me and I have, I, I've shared with them all of my tape. Um, and I said, Hey, I'll give, I'll give this to you either way. But my, my one request is that I get to record all this? Mm-hmm. And he said, "Sure, that's fine." I'm like, "Awesome!" So you'll hear that one day. But um, yeah, I think that you know, in Up in Vanity season one, Tara Grinstead, who was murdered in South Georgia, um, they eventually had a trial last year, and the the prosecution called me as a as a witness, but only just to try to keep me out of the courtroom. Oh man! Um, and they just it, it was kind of like some middle school playground immaturity level stuff and they lost the case which it's it's like you know all the information i put out there was for them to consider and uh i don't think they did i think they just wanted to be right instead of trying to find what made sense do you see yourself as a journalist or a podcaster um you know it's, it's one of those questions where i've been I've, I'm like, I'm not a, I'm not a real journalist. And right. someone goes, yes, you are. And I'm like, okay. And then I'm like, I'm a journalist. And like, don't say that. Cause a real journalist is going to be offended by that. And I'm like, I'm whenever you want. But what I know is that I, I do go to uncomfortable places uh, more than a lot of journalists that I know and get big stories that are not easy on, on you to, as a, as a, creator to go get and so whatever that means and uh, i don't really care about the label as long as it's uh i'm making something that feels powerful and people are into it don't you love the hunt though i love research oh, yeah, dude love i am so addicted to doing research keeps you going man it's like yeah it's like that's the thing that's like keep going back to it you're like man here we go back on the saddle <laughs> it's like uh yeah, no, trust me. And thankfully, I'm surrounded by people now who feel similarly. And so it feels kind of like a you know, camaraderie kind of vibe. Like, okay, let's go, let's go find this stuff, yeah, right? Like, yeah. Let's go get this. Yeah, because the way that you do your research and the way that you get into your stories, you're, you're the type of guy where somebody sees you at a Starbucks and they're going to say, oh, crap, he's here. He's up to something. <laughs> there he is, that bleached hair guy. <laughs> I knew it. <laughs> so when are you going to start your game show? Because, I mean, you come on. You, you you talked about it. Now you have to do it. You guys planted it in the universe. Um, Whenever you want. I mean, uh, are, you, are you co-hosting or what? <laughs> no, I'm just going to be the guy behind the camera. I'm, I'm going to catch all your, your, your grins and all that kind of – because I thought that was very funny when they were trying to get Jeff to laugh. I just thought, oh, of course they did. You know, you never was, get to see that right. stuff. You don't think about that, but you're like, of course they were doing that. <laughs> right? It's like, yeah. It, it, it kind of humanized the whole thing. Yeah. Um, I mean, whenever Jeff wants to, to do it, I'll do it. <laughs> I'll be the new one. But yeah, I, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely not smarter than a fifth grader. I've seen that show. <laughs> I don't think I am. Is there a side of you that would like to be on, on the radio? Or is it, you know, because I mean, I, I've been at f- 44 years and it's like, I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back. I like this. What about you? Um, you know, I, I grew up, one of my, my idols growing up was uh, my my cousin, I guess he's my cousin-in-law, technically, basically my cousin's 
husband. He was a, a pretty popular radio host here in Atlanta. There's a station called 99X back yeah. in the day. Yeah. And he has, uh, he had a show, uh, Toucher and Rich. He's actually rich, if you know who that is. Yeah. Um, so I, I grew up listening to him and he was doing stuff that was, I mean, back then I think he was doing stunts and like radio pranks and yeah. all kind of like yeah. just wild stuff. And I thought that was just bizarre and badass this this was his job right <laughs> if i grew up like you know thinking that that was cool but i couldn't do that and i found it strange when i was making audio shows um i, I think that uh, podcast radio it's like it's whatever it's it's i think i like the creating process more than i like doing live stuff i think the live stuff is it's just like a component that I just have to do, yep. <laughs> right? Yep. Um, that like I'm good for, but it's not really like what I do it for, you know? Yeah, yeah. dude, you got to come back to this show anytime in the future. You're down there oh, in Atlanta. You, I'm up here in Charlotte. You know, maybe one day we can drop this this dirty birds thing that we've got with those Atlanta Falcons. They stink. We hey, hate man. them. <laughs> oh man, how y'all doing though? Y'all aren't doing that. We great, suck. Are you? We suck. I'm sorry. <laughs> is Baker Mayfield? Is he? Is he hurt? Is he playing? Is he? Does it matter? No, he's, he's down in Jacksonville now. We we've got it. We've oh, got it. Yeah, see, that even, yeah, that's how irrelevant you got right now. <laughs> I mean, we just fired our head coach, man, after yeah, only 10 yeah. games. So it's <laughs> we're having a hard time, too, though. I mean, we have a couple of fun players, but God, we just, we're going to we're gonna falcon this way out of here. We know it. We're going to be a falcon in any minute now. <laughs> well, you be brilliant today, okay, dude? Hey, thank you, man. I appreciate it.